Moguće da su promijenili sada, a možda i nisu. Da, 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 da. 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 Da, da, da.
to Python Belgrade's Let Me Kill the Music. Yes, good. All right. Welcome, everyone, to Python Belgrade. Uh, this is uh, 12 Python Belgrade we're making. Uh, we're, I started this like a long time ago. Let me just ask you a quick question. How much of you guys are new to this event? OK. All right. The numbers are decreasing. Uh, okay. Uh, so the the thing behind Python Belgrade lasts like two, around two hours. There's going to be three people talking. Uh, the uh, lecture is roughly around two, 20 minutes, and then there's like a five minute uh, question and answer time. After that, we proceed to the next one. Then we have some food, and uh, the final uh, person is going to be talking. So, and after that, we're going to go to the Silicon Drink About, which is an event our friends are organizing. Uh, we're going to go get beers, talk, do networking there, and basically that's about it. So the first person is Mr. Tsimpe. Uh, he's from Croatia, and he's going to tell us about serverless architecture in Python. A bit. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, video. Boom. Works. <laughs> Second. 
Uh, so, hello, I'm Mislav. Uh, I'm a web developer from Zygnet. I'm a primarily a Python de developer, but uh, lately I've been dabbling with the ops side of my full stack uh, developer title. Serverless is something uh, uh, that is often talked about lately, lately uh, but not a lot of us had a chance to uh, do something with it. For the past few weeks, uh, I finally took some time uh, aside, and I'm here to present uh, my findings and uh, a couple of my experiments. So what is serverless? The term on its own is a bit absurd, as a lot of things uh, in our uh, IT vocabulary. But uh, we all learn to get along with it. So serverless doesn't really mean that it's without servers but uh, the developer uh, doesn't really have to uh, worry about it then. So in essence, concerning uh, the developer himself, it is without service. These days, most developers aren't writing uh, their code in assembly. They're using modern languages that they, they know how to use uh, CPU, memory, uh, storage, and uh, network resources uh, on their own without uh, extra input, input from the developer. And serverless takes uh, this one step further, abstracting the infrastructure layer. Uh, developers are building small blocks of, codes, of code functions, which can be uh, chained and interlinked together to create a bigger application. Each function is called uh, when and if needed. So uh, if we observe, uh, the serverless from the point of view of function, we arrive to a better name, and that is function as a service. Throughout the presentation, uh, I will uh, use both terms, because sometimes it's really long to say function as a service every time. So, so uh, there are several providers uh, available today. Uh, I'll present uh, the top three. The first one is AWS's Lambda is the one most talk about, is the one that exists on the market for uh, the longest period of time. But as expected, uh, other cloud providers uh, also have their own solutions. Azure has functions, and uh, Google has Google Cloud functions. They all uh, uh, have the same uh, set of languages that you can uh, develop on except Google Cloud that only has uh, JS. All providers uh, are tightly integrated uh, into their own platforms, so the triggers that can actually fun uh, that can trigger the function itself uh, usually arrive from within the uh, platform's ecosystem. Also, a uh, very important thing to uh, know is that all th these three providers uh, provide a free uh, a tier of one million requests, one million uh, of your function is executions for free. <coughs> so if anyone wants to go and play, uh, you, you can do it for free. I, I don't think that you will, uh, in one day, execute your function <coughs> one million times. So. Yeah. Uh, I provided here a link to a detailed uh, comparison. Uh, I will, the talk is uh, published on my GitHub page. You can uh, look at it later and click the link. Yeah. So, uh, before I continue talking about advantages, I want to have a confession. I'm still in a honeymoon phase uh, with serverless, so everything is uh, beautiful and dandy, and everything that is not working, uh, I don't take it as such a bad thing. The most important uh, thing, uh, the most important advantage, I think, is it is is uh, the shortening uh, time from to take something from idea to launch. Uh, the usual path is uh, you have an idea, of course, uh, you write your code, you go out and buy a server, uh, you install operating system, you install a web server, you install a WSGI server, you set up supervisor, firewall, domain name server, backups, and 10 steps like that. And honestly, the only thing uh, most developers want to do is just write your code, deploy it, and release it to the world. 
Anything else uh, can be someone else's problem. Which leads us uh, to the second uh, advantage, that there is no system administration and there is no need for sysadmins. I don't know if we have sysadmins here. Don't worry, we won't lose your jobs. <laughs> but uh, in serverless, uh, all the infrastructure, part of the equation, is taking care of uh, the provider and themselves. Only thing the developer needs to do is to write the code, package it, uh, and upload it to a function as a service platform. We don't have system admins, uh, but we have automatic scaling. When you write your uh, little function, all of a sudden uh, you can scale that function to be used uh, and to serve a thousand times uh, uh, more uh, requests than you could ever imagine you could, uh, or you could do on your own infrastructure. Of course, scaling works uh, both ways. When uh, you don't need the function, the, function, uh, uh, the functions are shut down. So you're not paying uh, for the time uh, when the function is, uh, isn't running as it is the case in usual server setup. You only pay for executions, uh, not the server idle time. The parallelization uh, is a bit similar uh, to uh, uh, the last one, but it's still a bit different. Uh, not only that you have a uh, thousand functions uh, available to you, you can use this function uh, to run them at the same time to do your task. Let's say that you have, uh, uh, I work uh, in a media publishing uh, company and we have uh, articles stored in our databases. So let's say that you have uh, 50,000 articles in your uh, document storage and you want to uh, add or remove some uh, data from each article. The usual uh, way would be to write, uh, to write a script that will go to each and every article one by one. Uh, let's say that it takes this a uh, bit uh, complex uh, thing to change, and it takes uh, one second uh, to change uh, each article. That would amount to a bit uh, less than 14 hours. We all know that's a really long time. But using uh, serverless, you can uh, write your script a bit smarter, and you can uh, start uh, a thousand uh, functions all, uh, all at once. And you can do the whole uh, updating your database in less than a minute. Yeah, same. What? Yeah. Same. Same price. Same price, actually, yeah. Uh, so the change in mindset is a bit less uh, tangible advantage, but quite important, uh, I think. Uh, function as a service uh, encourages creating small parts, loosely connected. Uh, it adheres to the Unix philosophy uh, that problems are easier to solve uh, if they are broken into smaller pieces. As such, function as a service is perfect for microservices based uh, architecture. Of course, not everything is so great. Uh, there are flaws to the uh, technology. The first uh, is vendor lock-in. Uh, unfortunately, all the top vendors uh, have their own implementations in place, and they are tightly integrated into their platforms. There are some, uh, some experiments, I want to call it, uh, from some projects that are trying to create an abstraction layer that you could write your function and be able to deploy it to all the providers, but it's currently just wishful thinking, unfortunately. Uh, under advantages, I've said that the functions are turned off when you're not using them, but that also leads to a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, it takes some time to restart, to initially restart uh, your function uh, if no one is using it. AWS is scaling functions, uh, uh, they're killing it around uh, five minutes of cold, uh, of if they are not running. Sometimes it is half an hour, sometimes it is just five minutes. No one knows exactly why and when are they killing it. You just realize that it's not, not there anymore. 
Okay, okay. So once you deploy, you wait five minutes. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so uh, when you deploy your function, it takes uh, some time for the initial start. If, uh, if let's say you you create an API point, if users are using your API point constantly, your function will never go to sleep. But if no one is using it, your function will go to sleep. That's uh, why you don't pay for the time when it's not being executed. Okay. And then it takes five minutes. Okay, I'm getting to that. <laughs> okay, so uh, in Python world, it takes only a few seconds. Uh, I had, uh, from what I've seen, it takes only like uh, three or four seconds, sometimes even less. But uh, in C sharp, for C sharp and Java, sometimes uh, it takes minutes. Uh, I've seen some uh, tests that it, it took 14 minutes. So I also given here uh, a link to uh, an article when, where one uh, developer gives a very detailed analysis. It's if interesting to see for nothing else that we are lucky as Python developers. Uh, maturity is also an issue on the platform. Uh, serverless uh, is an idea that only exists for the past three years. Uh, things are still changing. Often in the background, the providers are not often very straightforward about it. Uh, new functions are added uh, slowly. Uh, let's, uh, for instance, Google uh, is promising uh, for the last year to implement other languages. That is still not happening. They don't. They just not giving an end date to their promise or anything. And also because the platform is immature a bit, debugging is problematic. It's often a try and error. Everything is working for you locally, but then, then you deploy and everything is broken. Uh, honestly, uh, the deployment uh, can be done uh, by hand uh, through AWS's uh, management console. I'm talking about uh, Lambda. But uh, just don't do it. Uh, when you're setting up through the management console, there are a lot of boxes to tick, a lot of uh, input uh, uh, boxes to enter. And if you delete your function, and it's very easy to delete your function, you lose all the setup. So you better use uh, some kind of a toolkit uh, so you can keep your configurations in your uh, version control system. Sorry. So the first uh, way uh, to deploy would be through AWS's command line interface. Uh, I'm guessing that most of you are uh, have some experience with it. But uh, it's not a big upgrade from uh, doing it manually to the management console, especially when you see uh, the lengthy command you have to enter for the deployment. So I'm guessing that because of this uh, complex uh, procedure, uh, several tools were developed. I'll talk here about uh, three of them. The first is serverless. It's uh, the most uh, in-depth project, the most uh, feature-packed. Uh, it also uh, tries to accommodate uh, uh, all the AWS's languages, so Python, uh, uh, JavaScript, uh, C-sharp, and uh, uh, Java. They're, they are the ones who are trying to create an abstraction layer to be able to deploy to all providers, but for now they are not succeeding because they are just too many differences. Uh, Shell is, uh, was created by AWS themselves. Uh, it's uh, advertises Python, micro, uh, Python serverless micro framework. Uh, it took some uh, things from uh, Flask and Bottle, so you have uh, decorators to declare your routes and such. Uh, it's a valid project. And so for like a little, a little project, I mean, if you have like one or two API points that are doing some very simple things, Sure, why not uh, use it? And uh, Zappa uh, is the last one. Uh, it was uh, developed to 
as an idea to enable deployment of uh, WSGI apps uh, to Lambda. Uh, when I say WSGI apps, I mean uh, things like Django, Plask, Bottle, uh, uh, Falcon, Hug, new API Star, and stuff like that. Uh, the idea is that uh, Zappa sets up API gateway for you, and then uh, when a request uh, arrives to API gateway, it uh, moves it uh, towards the function. The function takes the request, uh, spits out uh, the response, and back through the API gateway back to the client. Uh, the common thing is for all these three tools is simplicity. Uh, we can simply, uh, you can easily compare the first uh, line with the other three. So uh, I think that all of the three tools are good tools. Uh, so just choose one for the task you have at hand. A little, a bit of side note. Uh, once you start, uh, once you start working with uh, AWS is Lambda, you quickly realize how slow your upload link your from home is. So you have to upload like 40 megabyte of zip file and you're waiting like two minutes for it. So things like this happen. Uh, good thing is, is that the deployment uh, is not making the function unavailable, uh, but the old uh, function is running and uh, when you upload it, when the new uh, function is started, new instance of the function is started, the new instance will have your code. So you have, uh, you can have an upgrade without any downtime, actually. Okay, uh, from the best, from the last three uh, uh, toolkits, I prefer Zappa uh, because of the cool name, of course, and because uh, the one uh, that was that uh, mostly uh, adhere to my uh, needs. So when I first started uh, for, uh, when I started for, uh, when I first started uh, writing this talk, I was pondering what kind of examples should I present. I wanted to show something uh, uh, that is interesting enough, but not too complex, uh, so that I don't make my life miserable. And I remember the joke I had a few months ago with my friends, an idea that was put on ice uh, because I didn't feel like uh, paying for a server just because of a stupid idea. So uh, uh, that, idea, that joke was uh, real Vichkitop. Uh, one more side note, Vichkitop is a tourist attraction in Zagreb that uh, every day at noon a cannon is fired that scares tourists and pigeons. So yeah, uh, and so Vichy uh, Top is a Twitter account that uh, has real Donald Trump account. Every day at noon, tweets a bunch of nonsense. So uh, the first situation was uh, fairly simple. Uh, I wrote about 20 or 30 lines of code. Uh, which can be summed to my uh, great uh, named uh, function to post something on Twitter. Uh, I created a base, basic uh, Zappa settings file. Uh, I'm, Zappa has a great feature that you can deploy to all, to all AWS's region if you want. But uh, since this is just a scheduled task, it made no sense, so I kept it in one region. And I'm also using uh, one way thing about uh, Zappa is that I'm able to store my credentials, uh, things like uh, Twitter API token and stuff like that, in a closed S3 bucket. So uh, that way I can actually open source my project, uh, make my whole code available without compromising uh, my credentials. And uh, in the end, I deployed to Lambda. Uh, Zappa has a great uh, command uh, that you can, you can u that you can use to invoke a function, whether it is the main function uh, of your whole project or any other. You can actually execute Python directly. Uh, so I did some testing with that, and everything worked perfectly. 
and then uh, I regard to some problems. The first one uh, being the biggest uh, AWS service around universal time, Croatia, of course, isn't. So you want to schedule something to be uh, tweeted at noon, but noon in UTC is not the same as noon in uh, Croatia. So setting up time aware, uh, daylight savings hours aware uh, scheduled task uh, turned out to be quite a nightmare. I did something, I'm not proud of it, uh, but it works. Uh, debugging uh, is a hit and miss, as I mentioned before. Sometimes you just have to debug uh, on the live instance because you can't uh, reproduce the whole uh, Lambda environment locally, unfortunately. And I had an issue with Zappa that Zappa packages everything. Uh, it took my PyTest, my uh, coverage, my linters, my Jupyter notebook, uh, everything, and uh, put it in a zip. And the zip file was yeah, 40 megabytes uh, large. There are solutions to that. One is to write a uh, bunch of excludes, and the other uh, that I'm not, that I haven't implemented on this project, but on another, I I did it all through a continuous deployment server, so I only get what I need in the package. So the second idea, uh, you had a glimpse of my second idea uh, just a bit earlier. Uh, because the idea came, it's, uh, came uh, while I was preparing this talk. So the idea is to take uh, this blank template and uh, uh, through an, uh, uh, yeah, and through some uh, get uh, get uh, parameter parameters that you can write anything to an image. So I'm gonna demo it a bit. I just said. So this is the blank one. I hope that you can see. the uh, backend developers uh, valid excuse and one more uh, for the front end developers yeah uh, the basic idea is that I can actually write anything here, and the text will change, as you can see. Okay, back to the presentation. Uh, so basically, it's a normal class cap. Uh, we have uh, the first uh, view to just display the blank image. And in the second, I'm doing some magic, and uh, uh, again, returning uh, a modified image uh, through, the, through the API gateway to the client. The gist of it is that uh, the, all images are actually served from Lambda. There is nothing uh, in between. I don't use uh, S3 buckets to serve my images or anything. Uh, I don't have any caching in place because, once one, I didn't feel like it, and uh, if I use an S3 bucket, and people with testing is uh, testing this out. The S3 bucket would become pretty large, pretty fast. And uh, this way, everything actually stays within Lambda uh, and within the free tier, free tier of one million requests, hopefully. So uh, here I used one of the Zappa's other great features because at one point while I was working on it. I shared uh, the link uh, uh, to uh, a couple of friends. I didn't want to take down uh, the link while they were using it. So Zappa has the option to, to declare several stages. 
so yeah, I just declared production stage that uh, that my friends had the links to, and the development that I only had the link that I could do my uh, testing, debugging, and uh, new deployments and all that stuff. Of course, there were also issues here. Image serving is not so trivial. Uh, there are some, again, lamp specific stuff. Uh, luckily, uh, Philo is uh, installed on uh, uh, Philo dependencies uh, already are installed, so we have issues with that. But we have other stuff. Uh, so maybe my probably my code can be optimized, but it's, it was an half an hour uh, coding session, so it works. And uh, unfortunately, one other thing that was uh, that wasn't uh, the, that didn't make me the happiest. IO5 monitoring wasn't working. IO5 uh, is a company that specializes in uh, monitoring uh, AWS Lambda uh, functions. They are the only ones who are doing it at the moment, and they are actually doing a great job. Uh, but unfortunately, not that great because it's not working for whiskey apps. Uh, I've tried to, to contact them. I had a few uh, emails sent with them. Uh, they are planning to uh, fix it, but it's not their top priority. Uh, that's too bad because I like really is a great product. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, I just want to say that I believe that function as a service is great uh, for microservices, but don't go crazy and plan your whole uh, architecture using them, because uh, of course there are examples uh, of people doing that on the internet, and a couple months later they are not happy with it. So if you have some uh, little side projects, side project, or if you think you can take out a piece of your uh, whether monolith or your whole infrastructure, take a, bit, a, bit, a little piece out uh, and put it on Lambda, go for it. I, I really don't think that you will regret it. So just embrace function as a service, uh, a state of mind, because uh, the idea and the technology is here to stay. That's it. Uh, here's, uh, I gave the link to the talk, and uh, both of the examples are open source, uh, so you can see my horrible uh, code. This is not my most, my best code, but it works. So. Okay, a, a little bit of Q&A, so. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, you didn't say anything about uh, the communication in the sense, can you put a uh, function that's really, really secure? Uh, the thing is that you can uh, uh, you can choose uh, how much memory you can you want to give to your function, uh, and uh, so they are giving out how much memory you can give. But when you increase the memory, they're actually increasing the CPU you have available. But when you increase uh, the memory and CPU you have, you pay more, uh, and Calculating the exact cost isn't as trivial once you go over uh, over that one million free requests. Yeah. First, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned that you're kind of right now working in media company, right? And you're using Lambda. Uh, for the past <laughs> in production zero days. <laughs> okay, I'm doing a call in uh, We are doing a prototype for the next platform uh, in our media company. How much time have you already invested in that program? Uh, since we are learning a lot of, a lot of new stuff, it's been like uh, a month and a half. Like, no, right now you're using one, right? So but no, but just uh, let's say that we, it's, uh, we are creating a microservices prototype. We have, let's say, I think eight microservices, uh, two are Lambda. So. And others are separate servers? Uh, separate servers, several deployments. Uh, yeah. So, 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 like, 
the virtue in the rest of the land. What's the level of that effort that it actually takes to migrate to the cloud or something? Uh, you probably just have to change the deployment process. And currently, uh, yeah, my company, I, do, I did it through continuous uh, deployment, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, so to, if I really want to change to, let's say, hey, Azure, I would just have to change that part. Uh, oh, but no, uh, because Zappa doesn't uh, work with uh, Azure, yeah. <laughs> Zappa is only currently, yeah, for AWS. So you're kind of locked in. Yeah, I'm locked in, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay for my company, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> they told me it's okay, so <laughs> I'm going along. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't get the full start thing. So, function goes to sleep and then the clock doesn't wake up, and what time does it take? So, uh, the function goes to sleep because no one is using it, uh, and the trigger. Let's say the HTTP request from Gateway or a notification from uh, SNS or something like that can uh, start the function. Or in my instance, with the GHK top example, CloudWatch uh, scheduler starts the function. Then when it, the function is started, it actually needs to be pro provisioned. But the provision in, uh, in, for Python takes only really much, three or four seconds. Because actually something has to be started on the server. OK? So it's not started automatically on somebody. It is automatically, but it, it's, it, it's not instantly. It can be started uh, within microseconds. But if someone is already using uh, that function, uh, let's say that you created an API gateway. Someone is already, other users, your other clients are already using that function. It doesn't have uh, that cold start because the function is already started, and that function can serve I don't know a thousand of your clients at the same time. Okay. Okay. Yes, I have low enough server load that the uh, parallelization is not helpful for me. Is there anything that this gives me other than if I had a Deployment script that was write um, like an HT access file and package all the things and write the whiskey file and upload it all to Apache server and restart the server. That preload the server. Does, does the serverless um, have any feature? Yeah, but you are starting Apache, right? Let's say I, I am using the same Apache server like I have that I have for a thousand projects and each additional one is just making a new directory or something like that. Oh, but, have, okay, but you don't want to do it. Well, <laughs> I, no, I, can, I can rent it from someone else. There are lots of yeah. services that will provide managed hosting. Yeah, if you so, if you want, actually, you could do that. And, and I'm wondering if there's something else, something that that wouldn't give me that, that a serverless would. Uh, you're writing it yourself. No, no, I read a little, I read a program. We can have a, we can have some free software package that compiles the, that uploads everything okay, and yeah. makes the whiskey. Um, yeah, but file. you have to worry about starting the Apache, right? Um, well, actually, sometimes you don't, but the, the deployment process has to do that. I'm, I'm wondering if there's something else. Uh, there's a parallelization that this, this would not be a parallelization, uh, anything other than what the server already has. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But is there anything else? That, uh, if you have the automatic scaling, you, have, you can't have automatic scaling. Yeah. But okay, with this, you can. It's infinite. Theoretically, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? That's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next uh, talk is going to be from Darko. Uh, he's going to tell us a bit about how to move your game to cloud. Something similar to that. So, uh, I think we can start with the next topic right now. If everything is ready. Aha! Thank <laughs> you.
scalable architecture that can support everything that you need to implement some games that are really complex and stuff like that. So a little bit about me, who am I? So basically, I'm from Croatia, from Zagreb, and I work at this company that focuses on mobile games. So what I do, I'm basically the server dev lead. So that's an a part of the company that's been around for like five years, and we do all the backend stuff, all the architecture stuff, everything that our games need in order for the, the users to be able to have social features, uh, save game features, and stuff like that. So, what I do is, like I said, it's a game development company. I don't, don't know if you heard about it. It's called Nanobit, and we have a lot of games already, some 15, 20 games on iOS, uh, Google Play, and those platforms. And this is what I'm going to talk about, how I do it and how my team does it. And first, I'm going to talk about the problem at hand. So the problem mostly is around mobile devices. So imagine you have a mobile device and you have a player that's in the metro. And the next minute, he's outside where there are 60 other people using mobile devices. So basically, yeah, you have mobile connections which are extremely unstable. So at one moment, the connection will disconnect. At another moment, the, the user will connect to a Wi-Fi and stuff like that. And when you, when you play a game on your mobile device, you want the experience to be fluid. You don't want to have like pop-ups saying, oh, you should connect to the internet. Oh, the internet is slow. Oh, something crashed or something like that. You want it to be fluid. So when you're playing, everything works. You load the, the other player save game, you interact with the other player, you have some fights maybe if you have such game like that and stuff like that. The other problem with normal like web stuff is that you usually have request response type of architecture. So basically you have to have a request to get a response, meaning that when stuff happens in the background, you usually wait for the pool, for the pool to get the push. So, for instance, you have to check every couple of seconds if there's something new. You and that's not what you want to have in a game that's continuous. You want to have instant stuff. So, for instance, when someone sends you a gift, someone attacks you, you want to know that in your game instantly, so not wait like 15 seconds for some <coughs> scheduler to 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 fire and then oh, this player attacked you and you are already dead because you didn't put your your army to, to defend your base and stuff like that. So the next big problem that we actually had that problem, we still kind of have, but it's more, more or less fixed, is cheating. And when you have multiplayer games, cheating is a big problem. Just imagine you open the leaderboard and there's like this player with nine 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 points and you cannot beat that player whatever you do. And then you contact the support and then you you're angry at the support, and support can't do anything, but okay, we'll kick that player from the leaderboard. You kick that player, but another one reappears, and that's a constant issue you have with cheating, and especially mobile games, because, because when you have like a rooted device, you have a jailbroken device, there are numerous, numerous ways that the, the players can cheat, and some of the, the types that we saw during the past five or six years are ingenious from uh, sharing save games to patching our content. This one, this one is actually the best. They patch the, the, the content so that some item would cost minus two billion coins. So actually when they buy the item, it will give them two billion coins. So that one was ingenious. And we, would, we discovered it was like totally, like it, it was a coincidence that we even discovered that that happened. So the third problem, Mobile connections usually have low bandwidth. <coughs> so if you want to update something in your game, what will happen? You will get a loading screen. When you start the game, say you have to download uh, 675 
new items and then you wait and then five minutes pass and you don't want to play the game anymore. So that's not going to happen in mobile games. And for instance, you want to visit someone else and you have to load that user's save game, but that user's save game is huge. And normally mobile games should be fluid, like I said in the first instance. So bandwidth was the issue, we tried to fix it. And so I'm going to talk about why we had to fix it. We, ha we had a legacy backend a couple of years back. And it was a normal backend that you will see, normal web backend that you see in most most of the industry. Imagine a big monolith, a Django monolith, imagine a SQL database, a big SQL database, and imagine normal HTTP requests going here and there, here and there. And then imagine you want to get 60 players you can attack. And when you want to get 60 players you can attack, you have a SQL, and that SQL has a join, which has a join, which has a join, and you have to check if they are not your friends and stuff like that, and you end up with a, with a SQL that has triple joins and is normalized because they told you that it would be, it would be great to normalize SQL, and you end up with waiting for 10 seconds just to get a list of players that you can attack. So that was the legacy problem. The other legacy problem which we had was that uh, this, that part of the game experience was not as important as the game itself. So imagine that you have a save, imagine a normal PC game. That PC game usually has the save game on your computer, so you can load it whenever you want, you can play it, stuff like that. And having the save game on your computer is a call out to cheaters, because you can change the save game. So that was the second problem. We wanted to move that save game from the devices somewhere else, somewhere else to the cloud, to the, our backend, so that whenever a user starts the game, it has to load that save game. And when you have a save game on a safe place, and we consider our servers a safe place, they cannot change it. So those are the legacy problems. And then we had to change. So what did we have to change? And how did we do it? So our first game in which we decided that we needed something new was four years ago. And we started developing a stack which would allow us to fix all those issues. We had an idea that it should be scalable. It should not have database issues, that the database would be a problem. We also wanted to move most of our gameplay that happens on the devices to the cloud, meaning that when something happens in the game, for instance, a user buys something, that should not be fixed only on the device itself, but somewhere it has to be checked if that's even possible, and if it's not possible, it should be forbidden. So when you, but when you do something like that, you have a lot of events that happen in a normal game. For instance, imagine a user playing a game, buy this, move something here, click that. Those are hundreds of hundreds of events that can happen in 60 seconds, and when you have a couple of thousand players playing the game, or in parallel, that totals to a couple of thousand events that happen. And you cannot process that amount of requests with a normal, um, I won't say cheap, but uh, backend that doesn't cost as much as you uh, have profit from those games. So something had to be done in that way as well. So let me just start. I'm going to draw a bit and show you what, what is and what isn't. We decided that we needed to split our entire backend into layers. Previously, we had a monolith, like I said. And when you have a monolith, the problem is that you usually process stuff on one place, and that one place can be a bottleneck. So we decided, OK, we won't do that. We'll divide it into layers. We want to have one specific layer that will do all the processing that stuff that happens in the game, so all the game. We want to have one layer that will only communicate with the game and do nothing else. And we need something else which will connect those two. And that's the part that we like to talk first. And it's funny, actually, because that part is something that is not written in Python. Most of our stack is written in Python, except for this. 
because we had an issue, we had a problem. When events arrive from the game, they have to be processed somewhere. They arrive sometimes not in order. They can arrive in parallel, and the user save game is only one instance, and it's complex. You cannot store it in tables in SQL, so locks are an issue. You can have race conditions and stuff like that. So we had to think, how can we solve an issue where race conditions to the database can happen? The first solution was, okay, we can do something like what Git does when you have a conflict. We can merge stuff. But that is as complex as your save game is. So the more stuff you have in your save game, the more complex the merge function will be. Okay, what's the other, what's the other solution? Well, we can have maybe only one place where a user save game can be changed. And that's the solution that we did. So basically, we, hope we focus all the user content to one exact place for that user, for only that user. If you have 1,000, 2,000, 100,000 users, and you have a smaller amount of places which can process that stuff, you have to narrow the stream. You have to route the messages to the exact point which they will be processed. So I'm going to go there and you have to move the camera. So I'm going to start with the first part of the stack which is the queue. So what? I'm going to call it the queue. So what the queue does, it has to route the messages which arrive here to somewhere which were there, where they will be processed. Back in the day when we did that, that was three or four years ago, you didn't have a solution, a queue, a message queue, which could do that and still cover all the edge cases where you would lose the processes that uh, the process, the stuff, where the connections uh, from the clients would be routed correctly, so we had to write it in house. So basically, we now have a message queue which is written in house, it is written in Go, and it routes the messages from the game, from the client, to the exact part here which will process it. And it does that on a session level. It's the same session you have in normal web applications, except that our session is from where from when the user starts the game to when a user exits the game. So one session is for instance two minutes, three minutes, and each session has an end part. So we route that in order for always to, to always have the same part of our system which will process that exact user. And one user always has, for instance, this is the user say again, let's imagine it's, it's a dictionary. It usually is a dictionary, except it's a huge dictionary. But you can only have one process from here which will set, get modified data in this dictionary in order not to have race conditions. Because, for instance, if you, have, if you didn't have this part of the system, you would have this process, for instance, and this process, all at the same time trying to change stuff in this dictionary. And in order to fix that, you would have to have some sections, and you would have, have to have databases which can fix some sections. And when you have, and the same game is a dynamic thing. It can have some keys. It doesn't have some keys. It's a document. It's like a longer document. Any document, for instance, in our case, it's big JSON. Double <coughs> big JSON. So basically, in order to solve this, you have to delete this and only have this process always changing the same game on one exact unit. So that's the cube. Move on with the comment. So. The next part is, I was talking about you have to have a layer that will communicate with the clients, and, we, and that's the web server. But if you put too much processing on the web server, they will block, they will be slow, and we don't want that. We want the web servers to be as thin as possible, and to have as low amount of them as possible. So only thing they do is route messages that arrive from the clients, through the queue to a specific process, I simplify the process, but I will switch to a different name later. So specific process that process that exact user, the action from the game. So this is the web server. It routes W E W. So it routes the messages to the queue. And the most important part of the system, which does all the heavy lifting, are those processes I mentioned earlier, and those are the workers. And the worker is a complex thing because it has to do all the gameplay, all the content, 
and you have specific requirements as well. For instance, imagine a game has its life cycle. You will release first a soft version, which is only in a couple of countries, let's say for instance 0 0.2. Then you release a different version of the game, 1.0, which has new features but different content. You have, like for instance, new types of weapons, new types of stuff like that. But the old version doesn't have it. Then you have a version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and all those have different gameplay. But if you have only one worker here for the entire game, you have different gameplay, you have different content. So you have to have different workers, different processes for each version of the game. And that's what we have to have. That is one of the reasons why the queue had to be so complex in order to route the messages to the correct worker. So for instance, if you arrive from your device with uh, version 1.0, you will have you will be routed to a worker which is 1.0. If you arrive with 1.2, there will be a worker here waiting for your request, which is 1.2. So each worker for each version of the game, but also you have multiple games which we have. We have like 10, 15 games. So okay, now we have workers for different games. So this gets complex and now it's more obvious why the queue has to be as complex as it is. It has to know which games arrive, to which versions, and it also has to fix the rate condition and to and to route to route the messages to the exact same worker each time. So those are the basic the three basic layers. When you put it like that, you have a thin web server layer which only communicates with the game itself. You have a queue that routes the messages and you have multiple workers which process. In our current case, I think we have around five or six hundred workers in total currently, scaled over 12 or 15 EC2 instances on Amazon, which only thing they do is process all the gameplay. And that gameplay isn't as simple as just make this key one instead of two, for instance. It has to check, because we have to fix the cheating part, it has to check if this is possible. Either. So if a user buys something that costs, I don't know, 5,000 gems, it has to check, oh, does the user have 5,000 gems? Is, what's the time current and stuff like that? So the processing part is the heavy lifting part, and we wanted to remove that part from the part that communicates. That's the reason for that. And I was talking about, we, about race conditions. Well, the first is protocol. Can I ask something about this or should I wait to the end? Can I ask about this or should I wait to the end? You can ask. Um, I see how this avoids the race condition if it's a, if a, a, a single player's game depends only on that player's save game. But are there situations where the, a player's gameplay depends on someone else's yes. save game? Yes. Uh, you'll get to it. Yeah, okay. I didn't want to talk about it because it gets complex. But okay. yeah, when you attack someone, you destroy their army, for instance. And you have to store into that user save game that you destroy their army. But your process cannot write on that user save game. So we developed something called internal <laughs> internal requests, okay. which are routed back from here back to the queue, and then queue know the queue knows which worker will process the events for that exact user. And you thought about that while you were writing the queue. Yeah. Too. Okay. yeah. yeah. The problem of, I will talk about it more in the pocket okay. part which you actually after yeah, in the web service part. So the communication between the game and the web service is web socket based. I said that the push and pull requests are not suitable for games because you have to wait for 10, 15 seconds to get a reply. When you have a constant connection open towards the, the backend, you can have instantaneous responses from the backend. For instance, when someone attacks you and you are connected in the game, you can get that reply in like milliseconds. And when you send something, when the, a, chat, a chat happens, something like that, if you are connected to the backend constantly, you get the reply instantly. So we have to have constant connection. But when you have constant connection, you have a different problem. So I hope everyone sees. There's our little device. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say this is a device. It has a screen. It has a whole bunch of and this is the connection to work. And this can get cut. And this happens a lot. And you know how to how to test this ideally. Because TCP connections, when they fail, you don't know that they fail. Because 
you just plug out the, the Ethernet cable from your computer, and this will simulate a loss of connection on the device. It's what we did a lot. So you could basic, basically see us disconnecting, connecting, disconnecting, disconnecting cables just to test this, this thing. And when you have a socket, like I said, you have lots of DCT connections which can get dropped all the time. So you have to implement some <coughs> sort of pinging between web server and the client to have always one connection active, because if this falls down and another connection is open, you have another race condition with the old connection which is still active and the new connection we just, which was done, just done. So we had to fix that. Luckily, the web sockets themselves had a ping pong protocol inside of them, so you can use that. So you would have the protocol. What? What kind of protocol? It's a web socket on top of HTTP. And it has the ping and pong messages as part of the protocol, like control messages which are ping and pong, and you know when the pong arrives, so you can you can still check yeah the connection is still active. If a pong if a ping if a pong doesn't arrive for like two seconds, you know yeah the connection is dead, I should close it, I should open another connection. And we had to solve also the race conditions when you have three connections open, four connections, because you don't know how, how many connections you have open at which point because the Kind of more lightweight protocol, like MQTT or something. Yeah, yeah but uh, this has to be messages which are normally routed to through routers around the internet. So basically, imagine you have a, an iPhone or something like that. You connect to a normal router, which is your home router or stuff like that. Uh, protocols which are not HTTP can get blocked quite easily. But uh, actually, this case for companies that are having roughly about 20, 25 million of users uh, like uh, mobile are using more likely. Yeah, we also wanted to use a normal TCP connection. Oh, yeah. Go as low as normal TCP, but it was much easier to load balance the connections which are HTTP than to load balance the lower TCP connections, especially since we were using AWS and the elastic load balancer there. The support for TCP wasn't as powerful as we wanted it to be. So, yeah, that's why the reason why we went above HTTP instead of going below HTTP. But the TCP connection, yeah, it would be absolutely ideal, but it had those issues with the load balance. So, I'm going to go to the next one. So, we also developed another thing, which is you have to have a way to control all the players, to change stuff in the game. And we have our big, I guess, web console, which also uses the web servers to send requests to change something in user's game. For instance, a user loses something. It happens all the time. You have to send 20 gems to a user and stuff like that. So we developed also an internal API, which also goes through the entire stack, through the, through the queue, and is also processed on the, on the worker side. Moving on. How did we answer? Oh yeah, we also wanted to switch our old games, which use the legacy monolith stuff, to the new stack, and that's why we also decided, okay, we won't transfer them completely because that would be a, a, a monstrous amount of work, but we will add a new endpoint on our new stack, so the old games can start using them for new features and stuff like that. So we developed also a legacy part of, on the web server, which doesn't use WebSocket connections, which can use legacy HTTP connections as well. And that's currently used. We have some games which are currently being ported to use that stuff for the new features instead of, of the old stuff. And now for the database layer. So part of the reason why we have the race condition is the other database. I think it's better to, to talk about it first. It's React. And every database which is document-based has a problem with uh, not so much race conditions, but with transactions, especially if you have randomized data. For instance, if your data is a normal JSON-like structure, some of them can fix that, yeah. But if you have a, like a random JSON structure, when two instances will change that data, you will have to solve the, the, the conflict which arises. It's also part in React, and we use React to store user savings. Why did we choose React? React is similar to most NoSQL databases, which are key value storages. But it has one interesting, interesting feature, and that is 
it's completely distributed and if you lose one of the servers everything magically works which actually happened to us for two months we had five real instances one of them dropped dead we didn't realize it for two months because everything was working fine and that was still in the, in the phase of the development where we didn't have all the alarms set up all the monitoring we were just two, two, two months later we wanted to connect to one of the instances to check something and it didn't respond we were scratching our heads, what the hell just happened? And we realized, oh, that React instance was dead for two months. But after booting it up, everything magically connected together, <coughs> sent all the data, communicated, chit chatted between the instances, and all the data was there because React had uh, stored data on, on a number of instances. It, I wouldn't go too much into React because that's a completely different, different chapter. What did we learn actually is a lot about React in the past three or four years, maybe even more than we ever wanted to know about it. And the other database layer that we use is Redis. And I could fairly say that we, at my company, we all like Redis because we realized how much you can do with it without even knowing. We use it for, we, we developed actually something of a message queue in, in Redis just to return the messages from the, the, the worker part back to the web server part. We use it for chats in, in the game because you have publish, subscribe in Redis. We use it for leaderboards because in order to, if you store leaderboards in SQL, you have to order them and sometimes that's a problem when you have a lot of players. So we store leaderboards leaderboard in Redis. We use Redis to fetch random users because you don't have to mangle with order by rank. You just have a set when you get, you say, you say give me six random member from that set. Caching is normal stuff in Redis. And we actually realized that we can do most of the stuff with Redis that we usually did with other databases, but there's a trade-off, of course. You don't have as much control over the data that is stored in the database. So basically, when we want to know what we have in this like 17 gigabytes of Redis memory, that's of a bit of a task when you want to see all the all the data, all the keys, and all the stuff like that. So you have to monitor that stuff. You have to have some something in place that will check, see what you have, delete all the old stuff, and that is a bit of a hassle. But we we solve that in our in our case. So for the last part, this is the part where I'll show the demo because we also wanted to do one thing. Uh, when you just play the game, you also want to have a way to, uh, to see what they did in the game. There are numerous times when we have support cases, oh, I played this and this happened and I don't know why it happened. So basically what we, we use the Elasticsearch and Logstash and Kibana to store all the user's sessions in a database. So we can search the user's sessions to see what the user did in those two and a half minutes when it played that game. So I'm going to show you that because it's actually running. <coughs> so basically, that's it. You can actually see all the sessions that are currently played over here. So, for instance, if I wanted to, I could refresh because this is all data. But if I wanted to, to see, for instance, what this player, NJOB0088, is currently doing, I can just filter out by that username <coughs> and see the user's entire session for the last, what, like five minutes. And we can see what the user did in those five minutes collected some materials, crafted some stuff, finished an achievement, this is a ping message, did a takeout order, bought some merchandise and stuff like that. So when our support team has issues with the user that had problems, we can just give them a session. They just have the session ID of the user, and they can view what the user did in the game, how it played it, when the problem arrived, they can actually also replay that session because we store the same game of the user when the session starts. So they just have to switch to that session and do what the user did and see what happened and why it happened, which is actually pretty awesome to them. 
Thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. And you don't have their information of the rest of the world, right? Of the rest of the world? The world. Okay. We have. So you have, for example, if you pick some item, but you don't see there, there was another item. No, we don't that. We don't do that. Yeah. We don't store the like the video of that. We just store the stuff that change the user save game because you have stuff that the user does moves the screen and stuff like that, which doesn't change the save game. But you can see what else was there in the save game. If you have the save game in that exact moment, you know that there, like five meters meters uh, left of that was another item that the user could pick because that was stored in the save game. So you can see what happened if you replay that session for that user. But is it in this session or if you combine sessions from other users? No, uh, you mean when someone visits someone else and something like that? So this is multiplayer game, right? Some of the games are multiplayer games, some of the games are not. We have a couple of games which have uh, strong multiplayer parts, like when you have battles and stuff like that. And most of the games do only have like social components in the games where you can help the user do something and stuff like that. So basically, when a user does something in another user save game, you will also see it here, of course, because that's also an event that changes part of your save game, part of another save game. Save game. So yeah, it can be seen also. Can you try data dog instead of this? Instead of the uh, we tried a couple of uh, other. We, we actually use uh, not data We use New Relic, but we use New Relic not for stuff like that. Server management. Yeah, for server management to see the, the, how much a transaction log is, something like that. But to implement like a gameplay log, you know, we, we tried to print it logly, but that was just for mm -hmm. logging. And this uh, this is something that came up after we have a, had a normal like. Well, a normal log, we realize okay, we have a huge amount of data. Let's structure that data so we can see what each user does and stuff like that. So we already had a running stack and we just used it for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm way about my time. So we also use another database. Um, I'll show it quickly. We use Influx, which is a database which is more for like monitoring stuff. We also have the other part, this, and this allows us to see if any part of our system is too slow. There's a spike. I don't like spikes. Uh, <laughs> so it actually shows how long it took for one request from entering the system until exiting the system. And this spike is something that I do not want to see. But actually, the, the, the green line is the, the average time it took. The yellow line is the, the 95th percentile. And our current, uh, our current time is around 20 milliseconds per request. And around 6 milliseconds is on processing the gameplay and stuff like that, which is actually pretty fast. 20 milliseconds just to process everything through, it, through the entire stack. And this is also used to see if there are any problems. We have this something that's called QDepth which means that how much requests are waiting in the queue because the, the worker the worker later <coughs> doesn't have enough processing power to process all the stuff. We have alarms set up with this and stuff like that. Okay. Well we have the local control. And of course, we also had to do a lot of testing. What we did is we created a bot which plays the game. We have like this big, big Python bot which simulates a user, sends requests, has predefined user patterns that have to be tested. For instance, when you have a new feature, we write down uh, stuff for that bot which, which tests that feature. For instance, buy this, buy that, see how many gems you now have, and stuff like that. And we also use normal unit testing, and we use this library called Hypothesis. And hypothesis is actually another topic for another talk because it can test your data with sort of a randomized set of data but with the patterns that you define. And it uses, for instance, this is used in our site for generating game content. We generate the content with hypothesis and then test the entire, uh, the entire code to see if there are any edge cases which fail for our current stack, for instance, if the gem price is above 100, then there could be an error, but we use hypothesis to test it to as much data as possible. 
So the stacks for our current stack is we are currently around 100 EC2 instances on two regions. We have one region in Southeast Asia and we, we have one region in the US. We have currently around 3,000 requests per second, which are requests that store the same game data and stuff like that. We actually had to solve the speed 10K problem because we had 10,000 parallel connections from the clients at one point. And our log part, which I, which I showed, we currently stored around 2 billion actions which happened in the games in the last 10 days or something like that. So basically, that's it. Thanks for listening. I'm way above my time. Okay, very um, quick, yeah, nice. So, uh, could you quickly go uh, a bit more in depth about the queue? What did you say it was implemented in, and uh, why it wasn't something like Revit MQ or Zero MQ appropriate? For yeah, uh, Zero MQ is actually a part of this. Oh, okay. the, the, it's written in Go, it gets the request from the web server part with Zero MQ, but it has to route the messages to exact, to exact workers which are on the other side. So when you have, you have multiple connections in the workers here, and when an event comes, it has to be routed to the same worker all the time. And that changes a lot because uh, the key that you use to route them is the session ID of the current session. And, and when a worker disconnects, you don't, you cannot lose that part. So if I use a worker disconnects and you send one request to another worker, you, all, you already have another race condition. So we had to solve that. We could have solved it maybe with another message queue, but it would be extremely complex and there would be a lot of edge cases. And we decided that maybe doing something internally would suit us better. And in the end it did because our current queue can process something around 10,000 requests a second, something around that, on one dual core CPU. And yeah, that's been uh, How mean. did you solve the issue of the work that's disconnecting in a nutshell? Oh, when I use, but we use the jump algorithm if you've heard about jump. So basically, it's a Google's algorithm. It's something that's sort of a consistent hashing algorithm, which always selects the same bucket. Mm -hmm. But when that bucket is not present, it will again re jump them on the other buckets that are available. So basically, when one disconnects, it will route to another, but always the same other one. So it can have, it can go into like a for loop yeah, when you have another. The, the biggest problem we had is when we want to change the entire worker part. We, we have to deploy a new version. So in that case, you have to deploy 60, 70 new workers, and they connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect all the time. One disconnects, another connects. One disconnects, another connects with the new code and that changes all the time, so that was the most important part for this disconnect part to work properly, to route them properly. So basically, like I said, when one disconnects, the other will rehash among themselves, and it can go into depth as long as how many disconnect, you have to reroute them for each one that disconnects. Yeah, I can go into detail. Okay. Thank afterwards. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, yes, okay, one more. So, where is your bottleneck? Yeah, I see the, one, the, the, is bottle, the queue is the bottleneck. But, uh, it's not intuitive. You can handle 10k and one instance handles 30 requests per second. So, to me, it's not intuitive. In which part? The entire queue yeah. can handle around 10,000 requests per second on yeah. one normal dual core instance. Yeah. But we currently have around 3,000 requests per second. This is the block the block per instance. No, no, in total. In, like from from the game. From the games, there are around three thousand requests that arrive to the bank. And they all have to go through the queue. We are currently in process into in process of uh, doing redundancy on the queue part. It's not only the problem that it's a bottleneck, it's not a bottleneck, the CPU is around ten percent of the queue. But the problem is if the queue fails, we have a big issue. So we're currently implementing something that will allow us to have multiple queues and to detect when one queue is down and something like that. So that's mainly the biggest issue that we have currently, and we are trying to see how to solve it. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Because we are a bit...
you know, out of time. Uh, we're going to have a very short break now, and we're going to do our last uh, speaker, Bookshan, who's going to talk, speak about blockchains a bit. So everything is <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, last event of the evening. 
Uh, is going to get uh, he's from a global company, uh, Game Credits, and he's going to talk about Python implementation of the project. How to mine the Python people. Uh, I'm All right. from Game Credits. Game Credits is what same company is here located in Delphi. Game Credits is also a cryptocurrency, uh, similar to Bitcoin. I guess I'm going to start with this one. I hope so. Yes. So, uh, so first, I need to explain what blockchain is. So, have heard it. about it. The blockchain is distributed uh, ledger uh, system that holds uh, cryptocurrency transactions. It doesn't have to be only Bitcoin. And here you, you, can, you can see the difference between the banks and the and the blockchain is that with the banks everything is centralized. That means that when you have your money, that is that money is in the bank and on the bank is verify a real transaction. But here, actually, you are the owner of your own money in the blockchain, and no one can tell you, can forbid you from spending, let's you know, say, the way banks can. So that's, that's the short story about blockchain, and I will, I will explain further down the road. So um, first, I'm going to... I'm going to show you how we can send the game credit transaction over the to the blockchain over the network, uh, and for that I I prepared a small Python script that does it that does that. Uh, here I have virtual. Um, I, I I put a Wagner instance a virtual box that holds uh, our client. Client is by client, wallet client. That is this game credit D. We can we can I can show you the list of transactions, the the commands that we can use. And in order to send, we need this command send to others. But okay. So in order to send, it sends the amount to given others. And uh, about the argument that is accepts, it gave credit others amount and some comments that that are only that doesn't go on blockchain but is only for our own wallet, so that's unimportant to us. So in order to begin, we first need the connection to the to the to the client, and to get that, we need the the parameters of the connection, that is the user and the password. And the port on which the client operates under local cost. So in order to get to that, we can we can get to the configuration uh, here. You can see the user and the password, and the port is eight three three two by default. So here in the code, we first we first make a connection to the local cost with the user and the password, and on the port eight three three two. After we get the connection, uh, we we need from from the input from the user we get the address and the amount he wants to send. Uh, once we get that, uh, we first uh, we need to check two things before we send the transaction. Actually, we need to check if this address is actually legit data it's address and not something else. And the second thing is we need to check if we have enough funds. So in order to check if it is the valid address, we simply make a call to this client that says uh, valid is the address, and it returns. I will show you here in the. Command here is address. So the command is it, it, it accepts the game credits address and it returns JSON uh, from which we only need one field. It, it, it is the is valid field and it returns true or false. So uh, once we get that, we return true or false. And if the address is actually being paid to others, we check our balance. It is the same. It is just the call to the to the client. We check the balance, and if the balance is greater, our balance is greater than the amount we are sending. We can we can send a transaction to the blockchain. 
So this is these are just error messages. And so what actually happens? Right now we can try to test this program. And send some transaction. That's um send transaction. Okay, so our current balance is almost five game credits. And we are gonna send it to my web wallet. So just a second. Okay, here I have my addresses. I'm gonna generate a new one, let's say, and copy. Console. And let's say we want to send two game trades. And now what, what it does, it gives me the transaction ID. I don't know what happened to my cursor. Okay, uh, it gives me the transaction ID, which we will save for later. So now mm, the transaction is on the blockchain. Well, actually, it's not yet on the blockchain, and that's where the core part about mining comes in. Uh, the miners do all the hard work on the blockchain. They confirm the transactions. And what I mean about that, I mean for now, uh, is what, what's happening to our transaction right now? It, it goes to a pool of unconfirmed transactions. Right here, there is like transaction one, two, and so on. And the miner is, is getting the transactions and trying to put them into a block. In order to build uh, each block on the blockchain, can contain multiple transactions. And the blocks are chained, that's why it's called blockchain, by, one by one. Hang on. And actually, it's more like this. <laughs> so, this is the newest block on the blockchain. So, in order uh, for a miner to create a new block, a uh, miner needs to, let's say, uh, to do a caching brute force, basically, because that, that is what is called proof of work. And proof of work is something that uh, in blockchain solved one, let's say, major problem previously, that is about all this. Why do banks have central, central servers, let's say? And, and everything centralized because they need to have a state of trust to know what is, what is real and what isn't. Let's say if I say I gave you $20 and you say you didn't, we go to the bank and bank can verify, okay, there is a transaction or there isn't a transaction. But on the blockchain, there isn't such thing as a central bank or central server, everything. Every, every client, right, right now, this client that I'm talking about is one node of the network. And it is connected to, to another clients, which are all uh, which are all equal in this system. It, it, isn't, it, it isn't anything like the bank where the bank has all the power. Here, everyone has the power. So what's stopping me from like sending you 20 bitcoins and then sending him 20 bitcoins and uh, saying, OK, uh, I, I double spend the money. So uh, the way uh, that double spending is prevented is with proof of work. That is something that, that the inventor of Bitcoin came up with. Uh, the proof of work is something that uh, it, work, it, it works like this. You, you use, you get all the transactions from this block and then cash them, cash every one of them. That is something that's called Merkle Group. You take current timestamp. Um, you also take uh, the the nuns, and you take the previous previous block hash in order to in order to, to append this latest block to the, to the previous one, and you you cache everything with SHA-256 algorithm. So uh, what 
what I explained what the Mer Merkle root is, time spent in self explanatory, previous block cache is just a cache from the previous block, but the nonce is, is a simple integer. It is something that you change each time. So, um, okay, I forgot to explain what, what is what, what, what is the difficulty. Uh, it is something that, that says, okay, you need to, to hash, to do this hash until you get a hash that starts with certain amount of zeros. Once you get the hash with certain, that starts with certain amount of zeros, you, you have mined this block, and you, as a miner, you get reward. Reward is currently 20.5 bitcoins or game credits, plus the, the fees from all the transactions in, in, in the block that you, that you confirm. And in order to get that, this, you, you are doing basically pure brute force with the nuns. Let's say you start with the zero. And you try to cache everything, and you get some cache that, that goes like, I don't know, start with 2CA, and then, okay, you increment the nonce, you, you try with one, and you get another cache, and you need to increment the nonce until you get the cache that starts with certain amount of zeros. I, I have a script that, that does this, I will show you in, in a few moments. And once the miner gets the script that starts with, with this many zeros and send it over the network, the, the the network is awards him with with this amount of bitcoins and additional ones from the from the transaction fees, and it appends this block to the previous one. So about this 12.5 bitcoins, this is how the the new money comes into the system. So the 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 total amount of bitcoins is something that is that is known. Up front, right now we can say that there is like total of I don't know how many how many millions of bitcoins that will be produced in 2150, 52nd year. So um, once the miner finishes with this, he attends our transaction, and then we then our transaction is actually on the blockchain. So now everyone can trust that we that we actually only spent our money once and not twice. Well, actually not yet. Uh, because what if uh, this, these miners, they, they are, there are many of them, and they are competing in order to get this cash as fast as possible. So what happens if two miners, let's say this one and this one from this different part of network, get this at the exact same moment? It's like very unlikely, but it happens sometimes. Uh, when that happens, the, the, the blockchain forks because we cannot know which 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 one uh, which chain is legit because it, it happened at the same time, but it, it relies on a, a very low possibility that this will continue. So after the the chain forks, I mean at the same time. Surely nothing can be at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean it it, it isn't at the same time usually, but Trust me, it, it happens that it is exactly at the same time that they relate to the network, and that then the net network gets their, like, let's say, because it's a huge network, it's not something that's like five servers or something, it's a very huge network, and half of the network gets the information from one, one miner, and half, the other half gets the information from the other. And then the, uh, the network, let's say, splits, gives believe that this blockchain is the correct one, and you believe the, the other blockchain is the, net, net, is the correct one. So actually, how is it resolved? Well, the possibility uh, goes further down. The, the, the next time, when they when they calculate the new block, one, one miner from the any part of the network will be the first one. The possibility goes further down. So this fork actually, well, I haven't seen it ever go past the two blocks. It happens. As much as true. So, uh, so what? What is the? So, for you, as someone looking at the, at the Bitcoin transaction, uh, you you can be sure that this transaction is valid after the let's say more than two blocks have passed. That's that's what's called confirmation. This transaction which is mined has zero confirmations. After the one one block is mined after it, it has one confirmation. Confirmation is number of blocks after it, and once. In the Bitcoin, generally, it is believed that after the sixth 
confirmation, there is absolutely no way uh, for it to, to not be to not be true state of the network. So uh, so let, let me show you the 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 actual program that, that does this. Of course, this program that I wrote is a simple Python program that uh, where difficulty is very low. Uh, and and the difficulty on the real network is very high. We wouldn't be, be able to do so to do the mining process without special hardware and like and without something like very much much lo lower uh, programming language than than Python. It's faster programming language. So okay, let, let me let me show you the miner. Okay, so here we have the unmined block. Uh, we have two parts, the unmined and mined block. The unmined block has the timestamp, the previous block cache, and uh, the target. The target is the, the, the difficulty, actually. So, uh, mined block, once once it gets mined, once it gets mined, uh, apart from these things, also gets the block cache. Block cache is the thing we are trying to, so this is the block cache. Block cache is what we're trying to get, and once it gets this this part, we we, we have mined our currency and we get the rewards. So let me show you. Okay, let me show you the real program. So okay, we we will get the target from the input. Actually, the network uh, the network uh, decides what the target is, but right now if you try try the real network, this program will probably never end. I mean, it would end, but like a, we would we would be even done with silicon drink about. So. Okay, so so here I have like some unmined block with some timestamp and some previous block yes, just for, for presentation, and we we try to mine. How the mining works? Here is the mine, and we we have one while loop where we accept where we 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 do the. The, the loop until the target is mined. How do we determine if it is mined? Well, simply if the block hash actually starts with a certain amount of zeros. You see here if the target is three zeros, and, and we get a block hash that starts with three zeros, it is true. If we get under three zeros, it is false. So uh, we, we try to cache this data, this regression thing that I just wrote, except from the, uh, from the Merkle rules. Uh, so here we have timestamp, we have previous block cache, and we have we have nuns. So th this is actually how you how you do SHA 256 in, in Python with this cache uh, library. And each time we increment nuns by one, so it's basically just a 32 bit number. So uh, once once we get get the transaction mined, it, it will return it to us. And we, we 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 transmit it to network, but currently I only print. I found a new block. So let, let me show you how this works. Uh, let's start the miner. Okay, so now we we will enter the target. This is the difficulty I spoke about to network. So let's start with something let's say very low, like three three zeros. You see, we already found a new block. It starts with three zeros actually. Okay, so now let's try let's try something a bit more difficult with five zeros. Again, it, it's it, it, even five zeros, but but you will you will now see how the how the difficulty grows. Six zeros, we find them, and I think with seven zeros we are pretty on the yes. Now this will probably last a couple of minutes. You, you can see here, nuns is how many tries it, it, it had. So here, it had 991 try. Oh, sorry, no. It had the, the 82,991 try. Here, it had 320,000 tries. So this will probably last a little bit. So while that goes on, we can check if our transaction actually passed and if we send, send the money to my web wallet. We can copy this transaction ID into our block explorer. What is a block explorer? Block explorer is basically a browser for the blockchain. It, it shows you all the data, it shows you the latest blocks, 
it shows you the transactions, you can browse anything. So here I link input the intersection ID. And here is our transaction. Uh, here is the amount that is to be in credits that I sent to this address. And here is the amount that is returned to me. Because the, the, on the blockchain, you don't actually have coins. You only have transactions. So in order for a transaction, when to, because I received 4.99 Gain credits. I need to send two gain credits and return change to, back to me, which is 2.99. Uh, and of course, here is a little bit more too nice because we have transaction fee, which is talk, which we just gave to the mine. So it says we have nine confirmations. So right now, if I go to our web wallet, we should see that if I'm not logged out, the program. No. Okay. So we we just see which is our address. Uh, yes, yeah, this one. You see, it ends with double X and H, and double X and H. It is this one, and we received two game credits, and my balance increased by two game credits. And for how many zeros you're mining? Yeah, right now, let's see our, our miner actually. You see, it didn't end yet, and right now I'm mining for seven zeros. But on the real network, the mining is done with something like thirty-five zeros, or, or probably more. So that is why, I mean, right now, if we were the only ones to mine, we would, the network would wait for us and we, we, would, we would finish with the mining and we would get the reward. But the problem is that a lot of people out there are competing, the people who have mining farms, and, uh, and we, we cannot compete with them with one laptop. Yeah, you have to What is the significance of, 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 of miners? I mean, is, it, is it like a random number that you're getting? No, no, no. It is, it is a number that you are getting from the network. That network tells you how, uh, after, after, let's say, uh, a certain amount of blocks, network sees how many blocks were mined uh, after, let's say, which time. So if network sees that the blocks are mined too, too fast, it will increase the difficulty. It, it will increase the, num increase the number of zeros. And if the network sees that no one is mining it, it will decrease it in order to have anyone confirming its transaction. So let's say if, if right now, uh, like five days ago, if all mines stopped, we would be able to mine the game credits right here from this laptop. But unfortunately, people are mining it, and you know, probably most of you heard how much it is invested in crypto mining. So, but the number, the, but the number is a random number. The whole thing. I mean, it's a hash. Yes, it is. It is a hash, but uh, uh, the whole brute, uh, brute force thing is that you hash something until you get certain hash that looks like, let's say, something. That, that's why you cannot, you cannot, uh, let's say, op optimize this unless you, of course, uh, do something that's like you split it into multiple threads or something like that. But uh, the whole point is that you, that the miners do that. That's why it's called proof, proof of work. We have a proof. That they actually work for the, and come to this. It is. It isn't like something that, that they can come with instant. And this is done. Uh, uh, why? Because we, this is how they, they solve the, the double spending process, uh, problem. Because uh, what's stopping me right now from sending the transaction to anyone and then send the same transaction to someone else? Because my transaction, I would need to to in order to put it onto the blockchain for it to become valid, I will need to mine this thing. And uh, not only that, once this, this thing gets mined, it gets propagated to the network. And you know what? Uh, uh, this here takes a lot of time to do. But once you have this nuts, let's say if, if we get, let's say, it's something like this, I don't know. And uh, right now, uh, it, it only takes one step to check if this is actually valid. Because if you know an answer from So once someone mines something and sends it to my node, I can instantly check if it is valid or not. Because I only do cache once, caching function once, with this nonce he sent to the network. And then I know, oh, this guy really mined something, or no, this guy is a fraud. This isn't mine. If it, so uh, let's say, in theory, uh, if you are that lucky, and if you can guess this number on the first step, you don't have to do all this. Then yes, we could, we could even mine it from here. But this number is very large, large and it, it isn't how, how it works. No one is that lucky. Yes. Yes. yes, exactly. So uh, is it always start from zero, or 
Yeah, 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 because difficulties, I mean, it's something they agreed upon. It, well, it, uh, when you no. guess this number. Yeah, yeah, when, when you guess this number, no, no, it, do, it doesn't actually, they have like, they have different algorithms for that, you know, because uh, you, can, you can set up your algorithm, let's say, okay, I will take a chance that this doesn't, that this isn't, isn't zero in any time, you know, and you just start from one. So if everyone else starts from zero, and if you have the same hardware then you will be faster, right? Uh, it's, I mean, it's not that simple. It has like yeah, more complexity, and those hardware are like something that's uh, you heard about maybe ASIC miners. That is something that is uh, the problem is embedded into the hardware, and it's not written by the software because even the the current GPUs are very slow for these types of miners. Uh, the current GPUs are only used on the networks such as Ethereum because Ethereum ban the, the ASIC miners, their algorithm only works with the GPUs in order to give regular people like you and me a chance to compete on this on this network because currently uh, for the Bitcoin, not even the, the best GPUs out there cannot mine anything. So, yes. So the, the assurance that the guy actually has the money is elsewhere in the system this only assures that there is delay, so that it doesn't pay more time. Yes, but, but actually, uh, there isn't assurance that the guy has money. The network doesn't actually keep your bond to be useful. But right, right here, in our systems, use for, for the bond to be just a number, a text. And when you get some of the number, some of the bonds, you get just one field from the data, and that's it. On the, on the blockchain, there isn't a concept of bond. There is only a concept, concept of transactions. And how can you calculate some advance? You you go back to the beginning of, of some of and others, let's say, and you count how much it spent, how much it received from someone. Let's say my my address here received ten bitcoins, and here I spent one bitcoin, here I spent two bitcoins, and so on. So my balance right here is seven bitcoins. Uh, so so the network is only confirming about it knows if the transaction has been spent or not with its algorithm. So you cannot do the double spend. You, I cannot send the same transaction to, to two guys and, and say that it is valid. Because that was previously the biggest problem with, with digital money. Because you, could, you, you would need to have a central server that bank does. Bank knows if you double spend the money because it has your information in that database. And it checks if you, like, uh, once, once you send the money over the, over the bank, if it definitely your balance. And, or maybe it works a little bit more difficult than that because the bank, uh, you know, when you when you send money from here to Japan, the bank in Japan needs to uh, needs to clarify with the bank here in uh, if if you actually have have that money and if it is okay to send it or not. So that's why it takes so long and that's why the fees are so high for that for that thing. Yes. I actually get quite different idea about what mining is that you're verifying all of the transactions back to the end and that that was the reason why it's taking longer and longer. Well, well uh, uh, no, 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 you aren't, you aren't verifying all the transactions, you're only verifying the current, un, let's say, unmined transactions. But, uh, but uh, you see, here is, uh, this is included in each, in each new block, previous block cache. <laughs> so what happens if an attacker comes and tries to change something here? You know about caches, I guess everyone knows that if you change anything here, any, like, if you change months from this number to, to a number that ends with nine, cache will change completely, not like, not like one, one part of it or something. So in order for, to change this, you would need to go back and this previous block cache would change. So this, this block would say, okay, this is, this is right, because this is, you would get completely different previous block cache here. And the network would know that, that this isn't valid because this, this block cache isn't here. So, so okay, let, let me let me just probably some of you are wondering can you attack this network? Can you can you you know get get Bitcoin down and so on? Actually, you could if you have the the, the huge amount of processing power because you could start from the end. Let's say we start from here and we we. Say okay, this isn't the, the correct. This transaction didn't happen, but this other transaction happened, and, and we actually managed to, to mine this block faster than, than the rest of the network. And we hold, we hold, let's say, over fifty percent of the network ourselves. So we say each each node in the network, okay, verify this is true, verify this is true, and and we are finished with this. 
and the rest of the network is still working on the on the on this regular chain. So then we need to we need to confirm this one as well. We need to change this one in order for this to change, and so on. And not only that, uh, but we 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 cannot stop. We cannot just send this transaction and say, okay, now I have Bitcoin for each next block, and each next block on Bitcoin happens in ten minutes. And on game trades, because it is small, the network it happens each ninety seconds. So, uh, so you would need to hash each new block every time for the for the rest of the life. I mean, because uh, once if you would stop here, then someone comes here and and takes takes away the, the rest of the network to take away your caching power and. And it will say, okay, so this is this is the correct one. This transaction that I spoke spoken about here never happened. But if you more than six, uh, yes, if you make more than six, yes, that that is a valid question. Then then you would actually someone would believe because what what is number six? It is only approximation that you wouldn't trick the network, but you would trick the central yeah. system such as exchange because exchange or our wallet checks if there is six transactions. And then we will say, okay, you actually you actually own this money, and you would trick us, but you wouldn't trick the network after the you you could get the money from us. I mean, but this in order to to do that even for six blocks, uh, right now even with Google infrastructure that that wouldn't be possible because the Bitcoin network is very very large, and on on the I mean in China there are, there are whole farms and data centers of the miners of the of the PCs that are actually only used for mining and run day, 24 hours a day because the reward is very high. You know that one Bitcoin right now is five thousand dollars, almost. Oh, I mean, I mean right now maybe four thousand. So it, it used to be five thousand, and you get twelve point five of it plus the subscription fees. So you get actually if you're a good miner, you you earn a lot. Even if you invested in your infrastructure, a lot. I mean that also depends because during during the mining process you spend electricity, and if your electricity bill is is low, let's say in some places I don't know like China or somewhere, then then you can actually make make huge profit on this. And that's why the network is so is so strong because it relies on on the people being greedy. So and it's just confirming transaction. Okay. Yes, 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 exactly. Exactly, exactly. Just that. It, it is just doing the creating new blocks and confirming the algorithm because uh, one in order to know one node that uh, I spoke about one node uh, the complexity of just confirming if this is valid or not. Because if you get the nice it, it just takes one hash. But if you don't know it in order to find it, that takes a lot of time. Yep. Yes. I have a question. So if I'm a small guy mining, yes, and I guess transactions go in sequence, right? Yes. And I am too slow for the this yes. one, then I have to switch to the next one. Yes. And I'll be yes. slow for that exactly. one as well. So how do I well, find well, a coin? Well, that is a good question. How, how would we mine from here? When I, well, actually, uh, there is no. I, I'm not even sure if this is done with seven zeros. And I told you that uh, the, the, the time for, for this, each each block is generated on the, on the King Trade Network approximately 90 seconds. So we had a time of 90 seconds to generate a block, not only with seven zeros, but with something like 35 zeros. Uh, and in order for us to mine, people invented something like mining pools. Mining pool is is a group of, let's say, individual miners, like we can join this mining pool with our laptop. And it, it calculates while, while we do this. It calculates our cash rate. But how how many cashes did we produce until this? And based on that, once this whole mining pool with its cash rate, which is a lot larger because there are millions of people like us, uh, once it gets a new block, it distributes the reward based on how how much did you contribute but with the, with the, with the cash power. So if you contributed a lot, you will, you will get more, and if you didn't, you will get less. So. So that that's that's the let's say newest solution to the to the small guy mining. Community. Yes, yes, exactly. Because you no one can compete with the data centers of mining as well. But it, but even that is the same case because you just have a bit more power. But if if uh, news goes sequentially, you will always be after some bigger guy. So oh, there no, must yeah, be yeah, some but, but no, no, no. I'm not like uh, once someone else mines a block. 
and you are still trying to do it. Network sends you immediately the information that this block, well, this new block is mine. Don't, don't waste your time on, on this anymore. So you immediately switch to the new block. You, you, you check if there are new transactions, and you get new transactions, and then you start the process all over, all over again. So of course, even those data centers of miners lose the battle sometimes, but then they switch to, to another one, and then they get more lucky or... or, or, or yeah, but I'm saying, if it always goes from zero... No, 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 it doesn't, I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to go from zero. I only hear, hear shows from zero because it's the easiest, easiest thing to, to show. If you want to gamble, and when you can do, you start with some... You know how, how large this month was previously, and you start from somewhere like from 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 top of it, let's say. You you're a weaker miner, but you have more more let's say more of a chance to get to it than, than someone who starts from zero. I mean sometimes of course. Not not, not always. What yes. about cash collisions? Uh, how, how do you mean about cash collisions? Oh no, I mean if you think that, that like the, the, it's gonna run out like of cash or if the it doesn't happen because there is the block, but the size of the block is determined by how many how many transactions there is. And it is like I, I don't know, it can be from couple of kilobytes to a couple of megabytes, and the current I think largest block is like ten megabytes maybe. It, it, that's the large block size you can actually make. You know, but just in order for this to, to not happen uh, because of the caching algorithm. So you can fit only like certain amount of transactions in one block. So if there is like, if the network is very large, as a big point, you sometimes need to wait not only for this block to get mined, if this is your transaction, like let's say transaction 100, but maybe your, your transaction didn't fit in this block, and it needs to wait for the second one to start, and then it fits in the, in the next block. So you have to download the whole blockchain, right? Yes, in order for, uh, for the miner to work, you need to have the whole blockchain on your system. So is, is, is that posing a problem? Well, uh, well, I mean, for minor, miners, no, because they, they download it once, and then you have, you have the ledger. Because everyone has had the ledger of all transactions that happened from the 2008, and uh, and the miners are like uh, sorry, can you repeat really, one more? This file size really, really large. Yeah, it is. It is for for game credits is like two and something gigabytes, but for for the for the Bitcoin for now it is like something around 1,000, 100, I believe. And it is always growing because this is the append only chain. You cannot change anything back, back. So it is it is growing and growing, growing. But like uh, the you know, it is believed that by the time we get to the to the let's say terabytes, petabytes, whatever, the the computers with this size will will increase as well. So so that it will solve solve itself. What's the Merkle? A Merkle root is you know uh, it is. Uh, for, for the transaction to actually be small, uh, Merkle root is hash of all the transactions. So you don't have to, to include each transaction one by one because that will make the, 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 the top side actually much larger. So you just hash all the transactions and then you put that hash inside. So no one can, can change any transaction in the future. Because if you, if you hash everything and you change anything inside, of course this hash of everything will change. How many transactions are carried with one block? Well, I don't know exactly amount of transactions, but uh, it is like 10, 10 megabytes, and that's probably around somewhere around, I don't know, 200, couple of hundreds, I guess. Mm. And like, it's the problem is some networks are faster, and some networks are slower, because like, Bitcoin for now is slow. I mean, it used to be very slow, like half a year ago. And now it got uh, a little bit faster because it implemented something that's called SegWit, and it says that you don't have to actually store everything in the block, but just some data that is in the header, and that makes it more lightweight. So, but that is the other topic. There is, uh, is there any other, uh, say, place where you can use the uh, blockchain? Just no mining transactions like that. Yes, yes. Blockchain, uh, that, is, that is the great part why Ethereum is so currently successful. Uh, they, 
they use the blockchain not only for cryptocurrency, which is like the, I say the worst kind of, of problem we can solve because it, I mean everyone profits from it, so everyone loves it. But they they actually made it so that you can uh, execute the code on the blockchain. And uh, and uh, this this code that you execute, I mean there is numerous problems with that because uh, if you if you write code very badly, you need to pay for each instruction in your code with a real Ethereum. Let's say that's how their network works. Uh, and the, obviously, if you make your code bad and not robust, you know, you will pay a lot. So if you make a while through, you will pay a huge amount. If you make an error and then deploy it to the network, it will take all your money. It won't tell you, like... So you can use uh, the whole infrastructure like a big server? You can yes, 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 because, it, because what... Something from the first lecture. Yes, because <laughs> what's, what's the thing with uh, the... Uh, with, the, with the blockchain, if you get your code on the Ethereum, uh, you, you will get the, uh, if this instance goes down, your code is still up. The whole network will need to go down in order for your code to actually be down. And this is, I mean, there, there are some things that... Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, so, so this, this, this makes the end of the lecture, I guess. Just, just yeah. add more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Jalapi. I'm sorry. Yes, the average process power. I'm not not sure. Like that's the 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 of the asset miner. I don't know. Like of the of the. I mean, it is very very. It is. Much larger than the than the strongest GPU because it is made only for this purpose. It is hard and only made for this purpose. It doesn't want to do anything else. And uh, it's like you can buy a Raspberry Pi and uh, connect to the base. <laughs> well, uh, well, yes, but the, the, this thing is. I mean, I, I don't know how actually S minus are made, and because it's it's on the hardware. You know, your code is down there. Like people, and some instructions are faster than on the on the regular GPU. But it doesn't know to do the things that the regular GPU does. I mean, apart from it, you cannot run games or anything, something like that. Okay, guys. Uh, yes. Uh, it's fine. Everybody liked it, so it's fine breaking it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, grab book here, network a bit, talk with him, ask him more questions, because obviously he knows a lot. Uh, and then uh, we can go and head out with our friends at the Moon Sushi Bar, where we have a silicon drink about where there's going to be more IT people, so we can talk to more. Yay. Yay.